These are the Lindsays. They both came a long way to get where they are now, to the land that has become a second home to them. Bob Lindsay was born in Oklahoma. Margaret grew up in the Far East. way to Europe. They've been in Africa all winter, and now they're on their way to Europe. The young people in this country are called Sabras, because uh, that's what the name of the cactus plant is. It has a little apple. And of course, it's very prickly on the outside and inside, very sweet. And of course, that's, that is true of the young people in the country. They, <coughs> they don't talk a lot. They do more very active and very energetic, always doing something or other. And of course, they're very good material for the kind of a country that this is, a pioneering country. Part of Lindsay's job is helping people. Some people's needs are easy to understand, easy to meet. Not everybody's, though. This makes Jerusalem like any other place on Earth. Jerusalem is like no other place on Earth. A city torn by love, torn by hate. always attracted the devout and the curious, tourists and pilgrims. A center of religious feeling for Jews, Christians and Muslims. lively monument, many conflicting feelings have to live side by side. Many people find this stimulating, but some find it hard to accept. Orthodox Jews are in a very defensive mood at the moment. Orthodox Jews feel that they have to, in some way, preserve the purity of the Jewish people. That if they don't hold the faith for the other Jews who don't believe, somehow the Jews will go down the drain. One of the dangers that Orthodox Jews see to the preservation of the Jewish faith is, is Christianity or anything like Christianity. As one of their poets once put it, he saw a vision of Jerusalem one time, and when he saw this vision of Jerusalem, he saw it without any crosses anywhere. In other words, he hoped for a de-Christianization of Jerusalem. And uh, to this day, when mathematics is taught in Israel, uh, the sign of plus is not a cross, but only a bar plus a vertical bar without a complete cross. So you can see that these, these old feelings are, are extremely deep.
It is among these people that Dr. Robert Lindsay works. The congregation that I serve is in what's called West Jerusalem, uh, a part of what you might call the, the Jewish area of the city. I would remind you, brethren, in what terms I preached to you the gospel, which you received, in which you stand, by which you are saved, if you hold it fast, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you... This is the regular Sunday morning service. Lindsay holds another service every week for people who live in the area. This is on Saturdays and is in the language of modern Israel where Hebrew has been revived as a living language. And that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. emphasis is upon the fellowship within the congregation, a warmth, an attempt to build a warmth, an attempt to build a sense, sense of praise and sacredness of individuals and dignity of people, and uh, attempting to, to let the love of Christ flow through them. When that, that occurs, we think it sometimes does occur, then, uh, then a great warmth is set up, a great friendship is set up. Basically, I guess you have to say that I'm simply a practical pastor living in Israel. In his job as a missionary, pastor, and teacher, Lindsay was faced with the fact that there was no translation of the New Testament in the language people in Israel speak every day. Uh, and you know, the right uh, Jews are very interested in friendship with Christians, and Christians in this country are very interested in friendship with Jews. I know you a long time. And here's Daniel from Kibbutz, and Dr. Lindsay. Yeah, from England. I think I must have met him. Sometime, rather. We'll probably see each other somewhere. Yeah. Well, we just find some of the oldest known New Testament texts are in Greek. All translations of the Bible have been based on these Greek originals. During the 50s, Lindsay started to translate the New Testament from the Greek texts into modern Hebrew. It has proved to be a grinding task. Because I'm curious, I keep trying, trying to understand these texts, you know, and, and uh, put them together and, and get back to the, to the earliest form and this sort of thing. And it's it's kind of like a disease, you know. You once you get started in it, and you see something fascinating, you just keep digging and digging and hoping, and some foolish Greek word and its relationship to a Hebrew equivalent and so on, and tracking it down in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and then discovering to my amazement that it has to be some kind of a Hebrew, uh, Hebrew word that Jesus used here, and suddenly 
you know, suddenly you see a flower sort of burst in front of you, and you say, ah, this is what he meant, you know. But on the other hand, it's a great annoyance. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a hard kind of work. And to tell you the truth, I'd often rather be fishing, you know. When we lived in Tiberias, Bob often worked very late at night. And so I was usually asleep by the time he was ready to turn in. And on this particular night, in, instead of just going on to sleep, uh, he came in and, and shook me awake with the exciting news that he had made a, an important discovery. And it really, his excitement was contagious. And although I couldn't understand what it was all about, I certainly knew that something had really happened that night. There were very few people able to understand what had struck Lindsay as so important. Fortunately, I have found a professor, David Plusser, who teaches in the field of comparative religion in the Hebrew University. Lindsay had noticed many places in the old Greek texts of the New Testament that didn't sound right in Greek. <laughs> All of these passages worked perfectly, though, as soon as they were translated into Hebrew. He felt this shows that there must have been an earlier text of the New Testament than any we know, and that this text must have been in Hebrew. But to find other people who do understand this uh, is extremely difficult. Professor Flusser is a rabbi, a historian, and a linguist. He has brought his deep knowledge of Jewish tradition to help Lindsay understand many difficult questions. It was very important to be able to understand these various dialects of Hebrew and to be able to translate them and work back and forth from Greek to Hebrew. of the parable of the prophet of Hostess? Hostess. He has taken the host of from there. Yeah. But, you see, he If Lindsay proves to be right, it means that the Gospels are based on sources much closer to the actual time of Jesus than everybody has thought until now, and that Luke was the first Gospel to be written down. I am not sure, because Mutar be Shabbat. Well, anyhow, and it's easy to see this if you... If you see that Mark, for example, in chapter 227, so very near this one, yes. has inserted this, sor this, uh, this rabbinical statement, yes. the Sabbath okay. is made for man, not man for the Sabbath, which we have in the parallel in the in the Christian. <laughs> into Hebrew of the Gospel of Mark uh, with a long introduction is a very important step for the understanding of the message of Jesus. It is for me a very great pleasure that I can work together with Lindsay, who is really my friend, and we both are prepared to learn one from the other and to change our opinions when necessary. He's able to see the little nuances that are not easy for me to see, uh, while I have this curiosity that drives me to do a lot of the tedium that's necessary.
During their work together over the past 15 years, the friendship between the rabbi and the practical pastor has matured and borne fruit. What was that man's name? I think I gave to one of the orphans at the orphans' home, and he sold it. If I remember, <laughs> make a little money on the side. And uh, an earlier one I lost because somebody stole it. And so I've had various cornets and gone through them, so to speak. But it's been years actually since I really played a cornet. Until a couple of years ago, I got this little beat-up Czech Slovakian horn in the Cyprus, and I've been playing on it. He's a very noisy person, and because I'm rather quiet and sometimes like quiet, occasionally I have really wished for a little more silence. trumpet or banging on the piano or singing at the top of his lungs. It adds a lot of life to the house and sometimes I can stand it but sometimes <laughs> abandoned Palestinian refugee camp. A city of people nobody wanted, nobody wants. Nothing now but wind, and waiting for the desert to do its work. Trace of life, except for an occasional shepherd passing by with his flock. But the people who lived here are still alive, still. 
still exist on the face of the earth, still unwanted. One reason why this piece of land will wait a long time before it comes to rest. During the war, the October War, um, the Syrians, uh, who are only about, well, their battle lines are only about 20, 25 miles away from here. The Syrians were very well equipped. They had many, many tanks, Russian tanks, and uh, they put into the first day of the war, got probably eight or 900 tanks, 1,000 tanks. The second day, they'd already taken up sent out 1,600 tanks in the direction of Israel and had broken through the Israeli lines. They almost came to the Jordan River. They're trying to put them out of commission. It's a very big job. And We've lived through so many years of, of tension and ups and downs here that uh, it, it doesn't seem strange to, to have soldiers or have check posts or anything like that, in fact, or tents than it has many, many times in the past, and I think we've just learned to live with this state of affairs here. For a long time, I think around in 49, in that period, um, I couldn't hear a, a car stop or a truck out in front of our house in, in the street without a uh, a sort of clutch of fear because during that time so often trucks or cars would stop filled with explosives and this would be the beginning of some terrible uh, catastrophe such as happened in Ben Yehuda Street which was quite near to where we were living then. He has gone with its uh, citizens through all these difficult times. Times of austerity when you didn't have enough food, and times of a divided city with a barbed wire and walls between the two parts. Well, now, did you have to pay that, that place? No. No, no it's the same. In our view, Jerusalem and Lindsay are inseparable. A couple of hours' drive from Jerusalem, the Lindsays have a weekend house near Lake Tiberias. I think we connect that water main because this is trouble if I can. Good, okay. They come here whenever Lindsay needs to work in peace. I think he's awfully good with people, and I suppose. Anyone who's interested in, in scholarly pursuits and s loves people, too, has a certain amount of tension between the two. I think that he's very uh, responsive to people and very understanding. And, of course, he, he likes to do things with his hands. Recently, in the baptisms that we've had in connection with our congregation in West Jerusalem, we have uh, we felt that it's rather nice, if we can, to have the baptism out in the open in the Judean desert. We often go across the Mount of Olives east of Jerusalem and down the Jericho Road. About halfway down to Jericho, there's a little turnoff that you can go off on a little gravel road and go over a little mountain and down a hill and uh, into a place called the Wadi Kelt, which is famous as the place where uh, Elijah was fed by ravens. 
course, it's very possible that uh, in the old Jewish baptisms, uh, the idea of running water was important. And the priests were supposed to baptize in water, running water. So it's kind of a nice idea that uh, just as the Jordan River was a running stream, that John the Baptist baptized in. Out of sand and rock have sprung the highest of human aspirations. Why here? Is there something special about this rock? In some, some way you have the feeling that what happened, these things that happened, were also caused by the land itself. There's an interrelation here that mysterious, and I've often felt it when I look at the hills or have, have just walked over some of the rocks, the fields. It really affects your, your inner life, just the very, the very atmosphere, the very land itself. It's all intertwined so that you can't live here without being affected by it. You can't come and stay and go away and ever be quite the same. At least many of us can't. I know it has changed me a great deal just to live here. <laughs> 